Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome back one of my very favorite guests to talk about two of my very favorite topics. Dr. Becca Tarnas returns to discuss active imagination, including some really detailed advice on how to actually do it, and The Lord of the Rings. All things Lord of the Rings, and Tolkien, and Middle-earth, and that's it. It's a really good time. Please note, there are a couple of Skype dropouts, unfortunately, which I was more or less too engrossed to notice at the time, but it does not get in the way of a really great chat. Enjoy. Dr. Tarnas, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much. I'm absolutely delighted to be back here. Yeah, um, since you were last on, you uh, you have indeed become a doctor. You've uh, you've completed your PhD. It was it was a humble Becca Tarnas last time, and now it is a fancy pants doctor. Yes, I guess that's true. It's been quite um, quite an experience these last several years. When we spoke in 2016, I was let me see, uh, just about to write my dissertation proposal, and the I had no idea what was in store for me. I had some sense, you know, going into writing the proposal and laying out the the framework of the content of my dissertation. I felt very ready to write the proposal, and I didn't realize how much more would be asked of me uh, to really live up to what I envisioned uh, for my dissertation itself. So it's been. now understand why uh you get a name change <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at the end of it because well it transforms who you are oh you know? i'm sure it does and now i'm going to have to ask you the question that every phd loves to hear um i mean you know briefly describe the thesis <laughs> uh, i'd be, be happy to yeah let's i mean because i know it it emerged from the research that you were doing that we previously discussed uh to do with jung and the red book and tolkien and so on but as you said you've just been through that um, well just it since we last spoke you've been through that in- incredible journey of actually putting it together as a thesis so uh let the people know um yeah wh- what's what it's about well, it began as that seed of recognizing the synchronicity between Carl Jung's Red Book and J.R.R. Tolkien's Red Book of Westmarch. And my initial conception going into it was that I wanted to simply lay out those is indeed something here that is in common between these two works. And what ended up emerging over the course of that was essentially having the parallels between the two red books open up a parallax vision on what I refer to drawing on Henri Corbin and James Hillman and others as the imaginal realm, the world of the imagination, and really having to come to recognize that this world of the imagination, the mundus imaginalis, is a real place. And by real, it discussing these ideas starts to bend how we use language when we speak about things such as imagination and fantasy and vision. So often in our contemporary language, we use those to speak about unreality. Oh, it was just imaginary, or oh, that was only a dream, or that was a mere fantasy. Notice all of those words that I put before all of those terms that kind of demote them. Oh, it's only a dream. It's just the imagination. But 
what I had to come to recognize in exploring the parallel between Jung's Red Book and Tolkien's was that there is a reality here, a different order of reality. And that Jung, through his practices of active imagination and even his spontaneous visions, and Tolkien, through his uh, writing and artistic practices and what he called fairy and drama, which from everything that I've read that he wrote about it, which he didn't say too much on it, he's tantalizingly um, cryptic when he talks about fairy and drama, but it really seems that what he means by that is something along the lines of visionary experience. And that there is in some sense a revelation that both men were privy to, that they were able to enter into this realm of the imagination and come across remarkably similar uh, figures, persons, landscapes, scenes, scenarios unfolding. And I was continuously blown away by the number of parallels between these two works that just kept unfolding. And in writing my dissertation, I put in as many as I could, but they're not all there. <laughs> I, I put forward the most potent ones and the ones that really spoke to me and I felt would speak to others. But there are even more parallels that I saw between the two red books that aren't even there. So to come back to your question, I guess the main thesis of the dissertation is that the two par the parallels between the two red books really seem to indicate that beginning at the same moment in history, both Carl Jung and J.R.R. Tolkien crossed a threshold into an imaginal world, into the world of the imagination, and brought back certain truths that they recorded in their two respective red books. Yeah, um, it's. I, I think it's remarkable. I mean, that was what we discussed last time. Uh, some of those, from memory, some of the uh, some of the shared imaginal experiences are things like dragons and magical trees and wizard encounter, wise wizard encounters, and so on, aren't they? These are the things that. Um, and again, because we only got the red book quite recently, it's funny because. They were both kind of cryptic, and it's almost because they were writing at the same time. Like Jung used active imagination in therapy, right? But we actually only got we only got to see just how intense he was about it with the publication of the Red Book. And you can kind of tell there's a they almost fit together. It's given that the way active imagination works is you do that imaginal encounter, and then in some sense you have to earth it into the waking by creating a piece of art or, or writing it down. So. Um, he had the active imagination piece, and you can kind of see that Tolkien, even if he wouldn't have described it that way, was essentially doing that because he was, of course, writing stuff after an encounter. And it's almost like they, it's almost like they click together. That um, they're both a bit cagey about what that dare I say ritual practice was, but um, it, it does seem self evident that not only were they visiting the same place, they were almost using very similar techniques to get there. Absolutely, and. That's also been one of the things that I've learned in this process and been doing more and more recently is teaching the practice of active imagination. So I've done it. I just finished teaching a course at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara that was focused on Jung's Red Book and on the practice of active imagination. And I've done it in a few other workshops as well of leading a group with um almost like a spoken word meditation into or through the layers of imagination and to be able to cross that threshold. And I think because in some way, those of us who do work like this almost live in two worldviews. We in part live in the more skeptical, rationalistic, a bit disenchanted world of modernity or postmodernity. I know there's that's strong side of myself. And then there's this other side that knows that uh, the collective unconscious is underlying everything, that archetypes are real, that they're living through us. And my rational, skeptical side will have doubts about, you know, what if ima active imagination doesn't work? Uh, what will happen if I try and lead 
a group of students or workshop participants into this journey to access uh, and enact the imaginal realm. And I have just been blown away, amazed by what is right below the surface for everyone. That it's not something that, yes, Jung and Tolkien were remarkable individuals in how they recorded their experiences, that they took them seriously, that both of them came forward with such beautiful works of art and literature and psychology. But this is something we all have access to. And that realization and seeing it in action has just been um, life-changing and so eye-opening for me. That's been one of the big things that's come in the last year or so as I've been doing this work and recognizing the healing power of this practice of active imagination. And that it really is um, a two-step process. And I think Tolkien delineated this really well. He spoke about his theory of imagination, which he called subcreation. And with subcreation, it's essentially first the process of the arising of images of imagination itself. And then the second, and so that would equate essentially with Jung's practice of active imagination of uh, holding in conscious awareness an image until it begins to move until one is able to step into or engage with the drama. But then there's the second step that Tolkien talks about of art. So taking that primary imaginal activity or the images that arise and as an artist. And it's the combination of those two things that produces what Tolkien called the subcreative art or what he wanted to call fantasy. Yeah. And I think this this is exactly what both red books are is that subcreative art or fantasy that comes from that two-step process. Yeah, it's um the I I think it's remarkable. It's a really um, brilliant way of describing it. We did the premium members did a course on journeying um, at the end of last year, I think. Uh, maybe it was the beginning of this year. And uh you actually find in uh, some Aboriginal cultures that you will have to, when you awake from in the morning from visiting the dream realm, there is a requirement to, in some sense, ritualize what had ex what you just experienced in the dream realm, and it, it honestly can be something really small, like a. Uh, um, like creating a little figure in the dirt or the sand or a whistle or something that lets the the sort of spirit realm around you know that you are an entity that can move between the worlds. And it's just, it is a structural parallel between things that in the West for, um, you know, um, reasons, for instance, your father would be well aware of, we have had a sort of 300 year break from doing this kind of work. And it's it's remarkable to see that it says something, I think, structurally significant that when we look at not just the parallels between Jung and Tolkien's process, but when we look at their processes in comparison to uh, non-Western cultures, there is some really compelling overlaps. Absolutely. There, there are. And I see this so much of a, as a process of recovery in the West that what Jung was doing, what Tolkien was doing is coming back to these essentially European indigenous roots of engaging with enchanted practices that reveal the ensouled nature of the world, of the earth, of uh, the human psyche, of the cosmos, and that it's a profound retrieval that's taking place. And that's why I think it's such an act of healing when we engage with something like active imagination or working with non-ordinary states of consciousness in various forms, that it's an act of returning to a primal source in some way, that the disenchanted modern West has lost to a large degree. Yeah. So the second, I mean, you just mentioned, Becca, that you've been teaching this for a year. So the second sort of slightly annoying question along the lines of, please describe your thesis briefly, is um, we kind of touched on it, but briefly, what is the process of active imagination? And we were talking about 
you mentioned the the sort of anxieties that um, any teacher has going into the process of teaching it. What if this doesn't work? So the second half of that question is, how do you know it's worked? How do you know active? How do you do it? And how do you know active imagination is doing something? It's a great question. So first, how do you do it? The way that Jung described doing active imagination was essentially to take an image that has come to you in a dream or a spontaneous fantasy, which is really going on all the time. I notice for myself, I constantly have just images emerging and we're so used to it that we don't necessarily pay that much attention when they emerge. But if you start tracking that, if you start paying attention to to when the image emerges. And I often struggle with, well, is it the right image? Did I pick the right dream to work with? Uh, Did I uh, choose the correct fantasy? Is this really going to lead me into the material that I'm supposed to be working with right now? But there's such an important process of just letting that go and trusting that in some way, any image is the right doorway for you. It's the fact you've chosen to go into it in that moment. So I will either have students bring an image from a dream from the night before, or one of the things that we did in this recent course at Pacifica was working with scenes and paintings from Jung's Red Book. So they're not beginning with their own images, but actually with Jung's and to see what happens in that kind of co-creative process of working with one of Jung's paintings. But I think there's really something to be said of working with your own dream images or uh, your own spontaneous fantasies. Or something else that I do, and this is more in a workshop setting when we just have one day to do this, is we'll start with a blank slate and essentially go into first a meditative space. So I'll lead uh, the students or workshop participants into a space of becoming more embodied, paying attention to the feeling throughout your body, beginning down in your feet and moving all the way up through the body, up out through the crown chakra. So you really get grounded in your embodied experience. Then start noticing your emotions, tracking your emotions. What are you feeling? And then coming out of that emotion, it's the translation of emotion to image. This is really what Jung was looking at, going from emotion to image. And that active imagination essentially can give visionary form to an emotion or feeling. And so this can be a really good practice to do when you're in a terrible mood or when you're caught in some kind of a psychological complex and don't know how to get out of it, whether it's anger or grief, sadness, um, or even maybe a kind of manic joy. But working with that emotion and then seeing what image comes forward And the thing that has consistently amazed me, but I have now learned to trust, is that an image does come forward. Mm. And by staying with the image, and sometimes that has a moment of kind of static holding, you stay with the image, and it cannot help but move. It's as though the psyche has this life pulsing through it, and it cannot help but animate the image. And one can first simply watch, be a witness to what unfolds. But what Jung encouraged to do was that instead of simply being a witness, like we're watching a play or a film unfold before us, step in. And then what I start to encourage the students or workshop participants to do is to ask questions and to listen and to really pay attention to everything that they see with you know, eyes closed, but the imaginal eyes open, the imaginal ears open, being able to listen, to observe very, very closely what unfolds there. And then as far as understanding if it's worked, coming back out of the experience, and I always kind of lead back out slowly from the experience, and they can last a good amount of time. Um, but when one steps back away from the experience, what's next really important is the process of objectifying the 
fantasy or the active imagination experience and integrating it. So the steps that I have with that first are to have the students write out the experience, every conversation they have, everything they see, uh, and also to draw or paint it. And I leave it up to the student which they do first because everyone's different in their integration process. And for some people, it needs to be drawn first. And then that actually almost continues the process of active imagination. And then they can write it down. Sometimes for people, it's helpful to write it down and then illustrate it. But I think both are really important, the word and the image. But wow, that's terrifying. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I write mine out. But uh, mm. um, yeah, I'm, I'm scared. I cannot draw or paint. And I know I'm, you would hear that a lot um, with your students, but that's terrifying to me now that now I have to actually do the other bit as well. <laughs> it is terrifying for some people. And I always just emphasize that it's not about the quality, it's about the effort. And that it doesn't need to look like any particular thing. If you saw a figure, you don't need to draw that figure as you saw it. You could draw the color that that figure seems to embody or to express something to symbolically capture it. It doesn't need to be some perfect artistic creation. It's more about the process of creating it than about what it looks like on the other side. And even that being said, if we give ourselves fully over to that process of creation, we end up falling in love with what has been created in that moment because it is a crystallized symbol of the experience that has come forward. And so often it has deep meaning, but I know exactly what you mean, that it is a very hard thing to ask of people. And I And then we come back to the circle together, the group sharing of the experiences and the pictures get put away. Ah. And so I have to coax them out, please put them in front of you. And, um, and eventually it becomes easier to to share that. No, oh, cool. I, I presume you do as well, but I listen to a, a number of Jungian podcasts and there's it, just coming back to the putting it in a structure together so or, or steps so that we can then talk about Middle Earth, hurrah, is um, there's a term I really liked and I don't know if, it, if it's one particular analyst, analyst quoting Jung on this, but as you say, if you, if you do start with your own uh, dream image in particular, it's almost like you can't, well, you can't get it wrong, however weird that sounds, because the way he described it, and I can't remember which show I listened to it on, but he said it's turning a friendly face to the unconscious. So it almost doesn't matter what door you use to get in there, especially for the first time, because what's in there wants to talk to you as well. So if you kind of make that pivot, it's the same thing with recording dreams. It's this turning a friendly face to the unconscious, I think is a lovely way of describing it. And so I, when we do the journeying stuff, it's the same thing. The anxiety is like, is this the right image? It's, it's quite basic, or I'm not sure if it's sufficiently profound. Like it's not this, you know, ornate tree hanging with diamonds that is on fire or something. It's, you know, it's, it's a road from my childhood and you go, then you go. <laughs> I love that phrase, the turning a friendly face toward the unconscious. And I think that's so true. It's turning some sense of belief or an understanding that there is meaning here, that there's something to be learned. Just that general sense of openness is really the key to unlocking any doorway to the unconscious. And sometimes I actually think it's better to have a more simple image to work with. It doesn't need to be that sparkling diamond tree. You may end up there someday, but that road from the childhood may be a more meaningful entryway for you. And what I've really come to learn in studying this and teaching it is to trust that. And in the very act of trusting, that's when the doorway opens. Yeah. Yeah. So as we kind of pull this into a, you know, shared area of joy and inspiration, which is Middle Earth, if we are using images that aren't from our dreams, when you say to, to begin an active imagination process, just to give people a sort of hint at the ritual technology behind it. So let's say you're using a tarot card or a John Howe painting or something, right? Uh, will people, because I get this and um, 
do people essentially have to look at it and then close their eyes? Like, when does it, from a ritual perspective, when do they allow the image to start to move and do its thing? Do they kind of stare at it like a uh, like a magic eye puzzle until it starts to warp and then close their eyes? Or do you kind of look at the image and then close and, and wait and see what happens? I would bring a certain level of flexibility to that. And I really think it depends on the individual and what they're compelled to work with and step into. So I don't think there's one right way of doing this by any means, but to to gaze at the image until there's some sense of internalization, that you can see it, as much of it as you need to see, internally when your eyes close. That's That's long enough. Because really what you're wanting to do is see things that aren't in the image. You're wanting to have the original painting or the tarot card be simply the first step. And so as soon as you close your eyes and let the movement unfold, step forward into the scene or journey in some way into the the world that's unfolding before you, that original image can be left behind to a certain degree. You're already seeing things that aren't in that original painting. And I love thinking of this when we're drawn to, you know, some work of art that feels compelling, where you look at it and you can't help but think, oh, I would love to know what is behind that mountain. Or I would love to know what is beyond that tree. And it's that impulse that we feel when we look at certain works of art that can lead us into that state of active imagination. You just want to go further into what you are looking at. It reminds me of Tolkien's short story, Leaf by Niggle, where he goes into the painting that he had been the character Niggle had been working on throughout his life. And then in his kind of afterworld experience, he finds himself within the painting and has the impulse to go beyond, to go beyond what he painted and to recognize that there is more here than simply the surface that he painted and that he can actually step forward into that scene. I'm just realizing now talking about that, that Leaf by Niggle is such a perfect example mm. of that shift from the piece of artwork into the state of walking through the imaginal realm or walking through the other world that yeah. we see in that story. Yeah. Well, that's a nice tee up because one of the things I, this is, I promise I don't have two annoying questions. This one's a bit annoying. Um, None of them are yeah. annoying so far. <laughs> but like, I guess, so we're, we are talking about active imagination processes because we're talking in a macro sense about how one can be inspired by and even sort of visit this imaginal realm, which... So how do you get the imaginal realm and Middle Earth to quote-unquote work in your head? So what I mean by that is, are they, are they the same place or is like Middle Earth in the imaginal realm, which is bigger? It's probably the best answer, right? But like, how do you describe the fact that Middle Earth has some kind of mundus imaginalis reality, is it the entirety of the thing for you? Like when, when you're, when you're talking about it or is it a, a, a land within the imaginal realm, a specific one? Do you know what I mean? I have thought about this to an absurd degree. <laughs> I told you it was a <laughs> <And> bit annoying. <laughs> not yeah. annoying, but uh, I, I've thought about this a lot and in part because in the process of writing my dissertation and wrestling with these ideas, I was trying to see an equation between what Tolkien called fairy and the imaginal world or the mundus imaginalis. And I, I do feel like that is largely equivalent. But if we step into the mythology of Middle Earth, fairy, what ends up being called fairy, there is the uttermost west, is the undying lands. It's not Middle Earth. So what is Middle Earth? And we can look to what Tolkien said, that Middle Earth is our world 
but in an imaginary time. And so the way that I've come to see what Middle Earth is, is essentially a, a presentation of when the imaginal world and the Earth realm were united. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's so long ago in human experience. We can go back several hundred years and you s can see the engagement with the natural world as being saturated with imaginal figures that there are um, fairies and sprites and dryads and so forth that are inherently a part of the natural world. And it's only, I think, been through disenchantment and modernity that they've been separated out from each other. And now we have uh, ecosystems in the earth seen as this kind of disenchanted dead matter from a certain worldview. And then separated off are the things that we call just imaginary dragons uh mermaids sylphs witches and so forth they're they're split off from each other and i think middle earth is you could say maybe a region of fairy or a region of the imaginal world as seen when it was still intimately connected with the earth itself and i think that's why it both feels so natural and so fantastic at the same time. Because really, and this is something that the Tolkien scholar Verlin Flieger points out, there is not a whole lot in The Lord of the Rings that is supernatural. Yeah, It's actually extremely natural. Uh, and there are the occasional kind of magical moments and you have figures such as the elves and so on who are immortal but they're not magic isn't on the surface as this kind of thing as Tolkien was very much against presenting it as and likewise probably the most magical object in all of the lord of the rings is the ring itself but what do we actually see it do and so there's something extraordinarily uh, natural about Middle Earth. And I think that's why, for myself at least, I feel most connected to the enchantment of fairy, the enchantment of Middle Earth, when I am simply out in the natural world and I can feel that enchantment there and I recognize it, it's more about the lens that we take to our world, see, being able to see the imaginal as part of the earthly rather than as the split off and separate thing. I love it. It's um, yeah. Cause I, I struggle with it as well as to how you conceptualize uh, middle earth. Is it, it, cause my next question was going to be as a subset, but you've kind of maybe sold it for me. Does the imaginal realm have an imaginal realm? Because if middle earth is in it, as you say, one, there's not a lot of magic in it, but death and the afterlife are sort of unevenly distributed in middle earth so whilst it's not in say lord of the rings there are nevertheless the kind of undying lands and all the stuff in the west so i like the idea of it being a presentation so fairy is let's just make this simple but so potentially a little bit too simple but fairy is essentially where tolkien went and Middle Earth is what he came back with. Is that uh, mm. is that too simplified when you say it's a presentation of a um, of a world that isn't disenchanted? So it's a presentation of a real, like of a physical experienced world that isn't disenchanted. But in order to do that, he went into fairy. Right? Is this is that kind of what uh, is that too simplistic a depiction? I don't think it's too simplistic, uh, but I do feel. You know, if we just look at how Tolkien described his experiences of discovering the stories of Middle Earth, of his writing process of The Lord of the Rings and the other works, it's one of being on the journey with the characters. There's, there are some things that are premeditated, but he has to arrive at them. And that when he does, he has this sense that it couldn't have been any other way. The story is unfolding beyond him. He's along for the ride with everybody else. And 
I think that's such an extraordinary thing about storytelling in general is this surrender of the author or of the artist to admitting we are not in control. We are not the ones telling the story. This story is being told through us and we are shaping it. But with Tolkien, I feel that, you know, he does describe this kind of experience of going um, cryptic language to do this. And I always want to be careful in how we uh, mm. talk about his experiences because he was never explicit. And I want to, yeah, to honor sure. that, to not put words or experiences into his mouth. Yeah, um, I, I agree. Well, why did he write it? And do you? what are your thoughts on whether these motives were a sort of after-the-fact realization? Well, I feel he, he wrote it because he felt he had to. So it began so early. It began in the years both leading up to and then through the First World War. And I really see the absolutely striking images that he painted and drew in the Book of Ishness, beginning in 1911, as the prelude to all of the matter of Middle-earth, all of the mythology of Middle-earth. And I think those were maybe the most pure visionary experiences that it's so, uh, there's so little detail about what's happening there. But he is essentially capturing in sketches and drawings with these striking titles such as End of the World or Before or Firelight Magic and so forth that I feel like those are just these windows onto fairy. And each one of those images, each one of those sketches or paintings is, is kind of, that's the closest, I think, to what Jung was doing with his images, uh, where it's just capturing in, in pencil or in paint a, a window onto a world. And then it became more sophisticated because you started participating in it, started mm -hmm. engaging in it and wanting to tell it as a story and to make it the book of lost tales and the, the first of the great tales that he began writing down in the during the first world war and this why did he write it in in particular if we look at the lord of the rings it's funny because he wasn't going to start writing that he wrote The Hobbit, and it was published in 1937, extremely successful, unexpected. Already, The Hobbit had started drawing in bits of the, the greater legends of Middle-earth. It, he couldn't help it. I think, again, it was just beyond him that it's something beyond his control. The story is being told through him. But when he was asked to write something more about Hobbits, which was what he called the new hobbit the original uh working title of the lord of the rings he said that he felt he had nothing more to say about hobbits the whole story of hobbits had already been told in bilbo baggins tale and that was it and it was only i think that's why it was so hard for him to get started like he just kept kind of starting over in those opening chapters of the lord of the rings kind of continuing to rework them it's like he's He's chipping away, trying to get back into a world. But that world was already there. And I think as soon as he opens himself up to the world he's already been exploring for over two decades, the world of Middle-earth that's recorded in the Book of Lost Tales and what became the Silmarillion, then suddenly the floodgates in some way are able to open. The story is able to progress. And you have this kind of participation um, and co-creation between the the hobbit stories and this this vast kind of ancient world that is middle earth that we saw in the the earlier stories that he was writing yeah the my impression is that in many respects he was he just worked there so to speak do you know what i mean like um, that's why I, when I said, do you think his motivations that he described himself were sort of after the fact realizations? Because people mm -hmm. land on the whole, you know, dedicating a mythology 
um, to England. And what I find, f- frankly, that's uh, like right up on the edge of being kind of like racially problematic in the 21st century. But I also, uh, which it is, might as well say that, but I also don't know if that's, if that was even a satisfying description of his own experiences and work for himself. I think, I think that shifted. I think he started off wanting to create a mythology for England. And that was very much inspired by seeing how the compilation of the Kalevala, the, the Finnish mythology, helped unify a nation. And uh, you know, he's doing this at a time where nationalism is at its height. And so that desire to create a mythology for England, I do believe was his starting place. And again, you can see that in the earliest tales in the book of lost tales, where you have the island, uh, that of um, Tol Arasea that is in some sense equated with the island of England. And there are certain locations, places meaningful to Tolkien that he gives new names and writes into the story. But even though that's where he started, that's not where he ended up. And that's where I feel that there is an agency to the story that mm. is greater than Tolkien's intention from his 20s. You know, he's in his, his 20s when he had that intention, late teens and 20s of wanting to write that mythology for England. By the time we get to The Lord of the Rings, I don't think that is any longer the the goal or the orientation by any means. And you can even see that in the map, that those early stories, they take place on an island, just like England. And that's no longer the case by the time we are in The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, or those later stories. The map of Middle Earth, yes, it resembles Europe to a degree, but it's also its own place. And that's, again, where there's this kind of overlap between the the Farian world and the physical Earth realm. Uh, and that's why I think that's such an important key that he's talking about, that Middle Earth is a real place, but an imaginary time. It is this Earth but in an imaginary time. Yeah, I. it's funny. It. I was. I don't know if you've seen it, but there's a interview with um, Michael Moorcock, who I don't actually like that much as an author, but it doesn't matter, at Shakespeare & Co. Bookstore in Paris. Uh, you'll find it on YouTube if you're listening to this, people. Just do Michael Moorcock, Shakespeare in Paris, Shakespeare & Co. Uh, and he was recalling his experiences of because he was obviously alive when Lord of the Rings came out. And when it was... When it landed in the bookstores and in the newspapers, it was viewed as some kind of post-nuclear science fiction story of, like, a Europe a few centuries after we'd blown ourselves up, uh, because the reading public's imaginal muscles were sort of so atrophied that they couldn't... I mean, this is an indication of just how much we owe to Tolkien, is that when his book came out... They, they, we didn't know what fantasy was. It, 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 they thought it, the reviews were like it's a post-apocalyptic, like post-nuclear science fiction story. And I just wonder if, because it's such a challenging and hard thing to do to to bring this up, and that's kind of what I mean by he just worked there in a way. Like he was not even sure. Do you think he was happy with his writing efforts at the end of his life? Oh, well, he's so self-deprecating, isn't he? Yeah, he has this wonderful statement that he makes when he's finished writing the lord of the rings where he says that it is written in my lifeblood and i can no other and i think he was as satisfied as with the lord of the rings at least he was as satisfied as he could be he knew he had given his human best to a vision that was beyond the human that he really did feel was coming through him and again and again in his letters he does talk about those experiences experiences of discovering something that was already there of not inventing but rather of finding the unfolding of the narrative and that expression of having written it in his own lifeblood and 
by the time he finishes, you know, 12 years of working on it, plus another uh, five, six before it's even published. I, you know, he started writing it in 1937. He finished in 1949, published in 54 and 55. What a huge life effort. And I think maybe with The Lord of the Rings, he was as satisfied as he could be. But the great kind of tragedy of his life work was that the stories of the Silmarillion were never published in his lifetime, and therefore they were not published in a form that had the same level of edited detail and meticulous care that he gave to the Lord of the Rings. That's the only one of his works that received that level of perfection, or perfecting at least. And you know, it's been such an extraordinary effort and gift on Christopher Tolkien's part, his uh, son and literary executor. I mean, what a karmic task. Yeah, I think about that on, often. My goodness. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> to take on one's father's works um, for decades and decades. And, um, you know, Christopher Tolkien is now in his 90s and coming out last year, finally, with um, the tale of Baron and Luthien coming out this month, I believe, with his last, last story, which is The Fall of Gondolin. And how perfect that The Fall of Gondolin is the first story that Tolkien began writing in 1916, 1917. And it's now being published a century later by his son at the, you know, nearing the um, final years of his life. There's something so moving about that, this kind of book ending um, of those great tales. But in his lifetime, I don't know if Tolkien was satisfied with all of his writing by any means, in part because he just couldn't bring it to fruition. And um, other than this one great work that so many of us read over and over again. Um, but how much more he created, how many thousands, thousands upon thousands of pages that went into all the tales and retellings and poetry and prose of the Silmarillion um, or the no will not see they're seeing the light of day because Christopher Tolkien has brought them forward as an editor does, but not shaped in the way that J.R. Tolkien was so expert at bringing that art to the imagination, bringing forward the sub-creative art. And I think The Lord of the Rings is maybe the only one of his works that fully achieves that. Yeah, it's um, you know, it's I have something in between a theory and a hot take. Um, it, it's fascinating to be able to have the uh, modes of thinking that we have now, things like um, Jung's work, to kind of look back on what was actually going on with the Tolkien's and and Middle Earth and so on. And I have this kind of theory all the way at the beginning, where he's he was trying to when he's back in that almost like English mythology mode, right? Uh, and we were talking about how he was trying to work out how to get the stuff he was intending to create, the things that do go into those lost and great tales and things to begin with. And he starts with that Ariel the Mariner idea, right? So um, this person leaves a, a sort of version of Europe and goes to a version of England and gets the tales from fairy and records them and brings them back for mankind. It was going to be kind of his first way of, his first idea of how he was going to put this stuff out there was that, right? And it's fascinating because that's that's clearly a shamanic journey. That's Ariel going into the other world or realm of fairy and coming back with stuff as a result of it. And it, I, I kind of want to put a Jungian um, or at least a, a Red Bookian, um, just to be fairer to genuine Jungian analysts, a Red Bookian observation on that, which is if you've spent all that time, if your image, let's just say, of of going into this process is literally this kind of it's almost meta this shamanic journey of going into the other world to get them and i f i have this kind of hot take that that's one of the things that opened the gate because his first sort of portal or his first coherent portal was this literal journey into the other world and back and it's almost meta because that's what happened to him and uh and there's something as you say a weird bookend about the tolkens and it it matches a fall and it matches what you kind of get in the Silmarillion, 
which is a decline in the fidelity of the stories of the first times as it as it moves through different ages and so on. And it, it almost couldn't be any other way other than um, Chris Tolkien having to do a, a, and this is again absolutely no shade on his life's work. Let's be clear; it's no shade on him, but it's as you say, it's it, it has a different clarity to his father. And I just think, could it have happened any other way? They, they've all, it's caught in this infinite loop of the imaginal expressing in the physical. I couldn't agree more that that image of the sailor of the mariner, the Ariel uh, later named Elfwine, Elf friend. Um, is it's such a symbol of a sh- shamanic journey and a crossing between worlds. And I have been amazed at how that image, even though Tolkien set aside that f- story framework of the mariner mm-hmm. going, hearing the tales, recording them in the book, um, even though he set that aside, and it, that's not the framework, for example, that the Silmarillion shows up in, that mariner never goes away. No. <laughs> and it's always about a journey into the West from the very beginning, from the very, very first poem that Tolkien writes touching on Middle Earth, which is that poem about um, Erendil, the mariner, and his sailing west in his little boat across the sky to the mariner Ariel. And finally, the final. Um, ending of that being Frodo going sailing into the West and going on to on his own ferry and journey. And that that's finally when it's completed. And what I've noticed is interesting about that movement. And you see this too, in those two unpublished, I mean, they've been published now in uh, the history of Middle Earth, but the two unfinished stories, uh, the lost road and the notion club papers that in those two, which are very different, it's like, they begin in this world. They begin with figures very much like Tolkien and his circle of inklings. And um, they, you know, they're they different stories, but they're tremendously parallel, The Lost Road and The Notion Club Papers, and both end up at the drowning of Numenor. And in that, too, there's just this repeating tale of the mariner and the book. The mariner and the book. And... What I find so striking about where Tolkien ended up at the end of The Lord of the Rings is that the Mariner leaves, Frodo leaves, Bilbo leaves. Uh, They sail west, but they leave the book behind. Mm. And that's what we get to keep, that red book. And it's like he was trying to find a way to to create the book in some sense. And um, it's like at last the the ending, the letting go can happen when the mariner can depart on his shamanic journey, but the record stays behind with us. That's amazing. It never occurred to me that way. That's like, uh, yeah, uh, Ariel wins in the end. That's incredible. <laughs> in some way, yeah. And then even even Sam goes, even mm. uh, Sam Gamgee sails away. I remember the first time I read The Lord of the Rings and... Uh, all the way back then (laughs) and read through the appendices and I found appendix B which is the timeline and that the timeline continues past when Frodo and uh, Gandalf and Galadriel and so forth uh, Elrond and Bilbo sail from the Grey Havens and to discover at the end that Sam too gets to sail west and that um Legolas and Gimli also sail west together. And this feeling that of completion, oh, that's something that I so deeply appreciate about Tolkien is how, for a man who left so much unfinished in his life, when he did bring something to an end, he really brought it to yeah, an end. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> All the threads are wrapped up. You never wonder what happened to anyone, except maybe the Entwives. We don't know what happened to them. That's still, yeah, true. True. Um, there have to be some mysteries. Yeah. Well, we are. We're talking about the the book specifically now. I think this is. I'm loving this. Uh, what kind of text is Lord of the Rings specifically? Like, is it situated in a specific textual tradition? We know that Tolkien, over the course of his career, was trying to. He, he had different versions of. Well, first it's Ariel the Mariner and its mythology, and then it's some kind of time travel game and and all this stuff. Uh, 
is the Lord of the Rings a kind of text? Hmm. I am not a, I haven't studied English literature, so <laughs> I feel like I can only give an unofficial answer to Go this, <laughs> uh, which is maybe more appropriate. It feels to me like, like a legend in some way that it's part of this larger mythology that extends from the creation story of the Ainu Lindale all the way to um, the ending of the Lord of the Rings. And it's like this legend that has stepped forward out of the mythology. And I'm always reluctant to call it a novel because the connotations of what a novel is are um i don't know what comes to mind is everything from jane austen to to melville and tolstoy uh whereas what tolkien is doing with the lord of the rings taps back into a more ancient tradition something along the lines of beowulf or um Dante. So I guess we could maybe call it an epic, yeah. a romantic epic. It's something like um, that. Because that's what I, I know what you mean about novel. The other thing that I, other than the nature culture divide that annoys me as a, as a sort of fictional, again, with that word, uh, artifact of Western thought is the notion of fiction in general. Like there's no, um, there's no fiction and non-fiction section in the Amazon. There are just stories. Um, and, and so they have a different relationship to what story and narrative is and how it is an expression of truth. And so when you use the word novel for something like Lord of the Rings, or even for other novels, frankly, but when you use the word novel specifically for Lord of the Rings, you're closing off too much before you even begin. Absolutely. And I feel like that line between fiction and nonfiction has really broken down for me as I have studied the processes of cre storytelling creation or artistic creation, that this is something that naturally emerges through us and is a natural phenomenon of the, the human and cosmic experience. We are storytellers, and that is, mu is as much a part of our biography as um, the kind of sort of history. Uh, and I think it's, um, you know, it's important to kind of delineate in certain ways. You don't want to kind of mash it all together and uh, claim that this is a, a telling of uh, world history or something, yeah. but it, there is something, I think what Tolkien would want to say is it contains truth. And that is something that the word fiction cannot capture. It's designed explicitly to exclude it. Like it's, it's this bizarre categorization I find very frustrating because I, I agree, like you, and this is why I like, uh, comparative anthropology, I guess, so much is that the, the relationship to an understanding of story or narrative um, in places that didn't, and it's it, you can kind of blame the right. I guess you can. Uh, you can kind of blame the rise of an empirical model about how we do truth. But the reality is, we've had that disease uh, in the West a little bit longer because we've constructed our societies around the idea of a book that contains a specific truth, and then there are other books. Like this is the thing with building a society around a Bible is that this one is true. This is the true one. These ones over here are not true things. So I don't know if we've had, it's only recently, I think that when we look outside, comparatively recently, last, you know, hundred and something years, that, that when we look outside where we are to say, well, maybe there are other ways of um, being with story and narrative. And, uh, and, and I think the Lord of the Rings is a, is a remarkable book to, experience that the erasure of that divide does that make sense it absolutely does make sense and i think these are really important questions for our current moment because our understanding of what is reality and what is truth is up for question right now the phenomenon of fake news uh 
of lying, essentially. We need to learn how to differentiate what is real from what is unreal. And by learning to also differentiate what is just made up and what is imaginal, what mm. is the, the truth of the imagination. Uh, this, as I was saying before, it's not like anything goes when we acknowledge that fantasy or imagination are real. Rather, we have to be discerning and recognize when something is just made up, when there is an intentional lie behind something, versus when there is a truth that is beyond the truth of hard physical material reality. Yeah, that's that's challenging. That can be the next course after this current one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think it was I'm I'm quite fascinated by this in uh it so there's story and as you, I love that a way of expressing the truth beyond the physical. Um we don't have the right language for it and it's one of the ideas I think we need to sit with is deception. Um and I write about this in pieces of eight. It's sort of the whilst you will find uh, mimicry and trapping and and like non malicious deception in the animal kingdom. So obviously, predators that look harmless and then you know prey on things. And so there's a particular kind of deception, which is the sort of deliberate weaponization of the non physical, which is. And we only have words like "is this true or false?" or "is this fiction or non fiction?" And it's it's a much more as you say, fluid and, and, and um, I guess, urgent work, really. As you said, like, this, is, this is definitely the time of uh, the world to be thinking about fact, fiction, deception, truth, story, narrative, because it's uh, coming apart at the seams in many respects. <laughs> definitely. It feels so important to be engaging with these kinds of questions right now and really to hone a nuanced sense of discernment. And I think that's so much of what we're losing and is breaking down in this current moment is a sense of subtlety and nuance and that everything has become so polarized that everything is being pushed to these extremes of opposites in the political sphere, in terms of economics, in terms of religion and so forth. Um, and we've lost the fact that there's so much that lives in the middle, in the middle realm. and that. We need to learn how to see again um, and how to trust our senses, to trust our imagination, um, to trust our sense of um, a grounding in reality and truth. That's fantastic. Uh, so what we need, Dr. Tarnas, is a journey to the imaginal realm, which is uh, um, actually why I uh, reached out on Twitter. You have something, which, by the way, can I just say, this course had me at whatever the elvish is for hello. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Michael Vaughn. There we go. There we go. Uh, and it, it actually came in a really in that odd synchronicitous way because I um, I first read the book when I was six. I think I mentioned last time we were on and obviously didn't understand it. And I've been ruminating on this. I mean, I understand and I understood rather a small amount of it as one would expect from a six-year-old. I was reading because my little, my friend who is the same age, he was, his dad was reading it to him and I'm hyper competitive and potentially <laughs> jealous of that. So I'm like, oh, fuck it. I'm going to read this myself as a six-year-old. But um, I've read it most years since then. And I've been ruminating on that. My first encounter with Lord of the Rings, essentially being like a child around a campfire, hearing the, you know, stories of a tribe, if you will, and not understanding most of it initially, and then with each retelling kind of getting more and more, which I, I, which pleases me in retrospect. Uh, but weirdly, I haven't actually read it for, I was doing the maths on this before I reached out to you going, I think it's been over three years. I think it was a year before I left, left the UK and I've been back in Australia for two years. And I'm like, I might do this over the summer, which it is in um, the Southern Hemisphere. We're heading into it. I'm like, hey, it's, it's time to do that again. Because I used to, you know, again, as I'm sure for most a lot of people listening, in some sense you're always reading Lord of the Rings. Like there's always you're always somewhere in it, whatever else it is you're reading. If you're like a super fan, and for me, I've had a three year gap. And uh, and tell us about this course that is going to um, break my Lord of the Rings drought. I am so excited to teach this course. I feel like I've been waiting two decades to teach it, and essentially, it's a 
it's a journey through the Lord of the Rings and being able to read it in the company of, uh, of other journeyers, of other readers. And so I've designed it so that it both speaks to the person who's never read this book before. And I'm so excited for those people because. Oh, me too. Oh, how amazing <laughs> to get to read it for the first time. My, um, my first probably, um, I guess full understanding of it would, I would have been about 13 or 14 and I took it into history class. Um, and my history teacher was an amazing woman. I can say was, I, she may well still be alive. I have no idea, but her husband was, a um, a famous novelist in Australia. And, uh, and so they were an extremely literary, um, family or couple or whatever. And she saw the book and she's like, is it the first time you've read it? And I said, no. And she's like, oh, that's a pity. And she said, when <laughs> I, um, the first time I read it, I had to slow, I had to like ration the pages as I got to the end of it because I didn't want it to end. I couldn't believe that this was going to be the last first time I was going to read the book. So for people who are going to be on the court, sorry to interrupt, but I had to say, yes, I, if you haven't read it, oh my God, <laughs> what, what you are in for and, uh, and carry on, sorry. Absolutely. I, I feel really excited to both orient it toward those people who haven't read it before and that this really can be kind of an, an initiatory experience into the world of Middle Earth. And I'm also gearing it toward those who, um, you know, may be returning to it after a long hiatus, many decades, or the people who read it once a year and want a new perspective. But what I'm going to be bringing forward because it's such a rich and complex tale um are all the things that that i've taken in in my many years of studying tolkien's writings and his letters and biography and so forth and to essentially unpack the parts of the narrative that you know when there's a reference to baron and luthien when aragorn is telling their story tell that story and give it uh situated in the larger mythological context. There's so much on a first or even second reading that we can't take in of The Lord of the Rings because it's so rich and embedded in such a fully realized world. And so what I'm hoping to do as a, a guide as people read the story over the 12 weeks of this course, and I thought, you know, 12 weeks, that's um, two weeks per book, you know, the six books of The Lord of the Rings. And um, it, I broke it down. I was like, you know, that's about 10 pages a day. Yeah, Anyone can do 10 pages a day. Um, and really wanting to just flesh the story out in full to offer the translations of the Elvish poems, to go into the meanings of the prophecies and um, kind of ho essentially hold space for a group of readers to go as fully into an experience of Middle Earth as possible. So revealing what is helpful to reveal when something is referenced, keeping hidden what is absolutely necessary to keep hidden when something is finally revealed at you know one of those climactic moments later in the story then pointing back to the earlier moments like do you remember when this happened do you remember when that happened um but essentially creating some kind of a um holding container for people to have a, a really kind of rich and story I uh, yeah um okay so as I said I'm absolutely on board for this uh, I think it will be and I haven't ever done we the premium members we have um, an on again off again like book club or, or movie clubs where we'll all kind of do something together but I'm I'm actually extremely excited not only because I'm going to learn a whole bunch um, going through this course but I am extremely excited at the prospect of a bunch of nerds all over the world um, reading the book at more or less the same time in the same speed I think there's something super uh, um, I think that's that's a wonderful experience to participate in. I think um, I cannot wait. So, like, honestly, Dr. Tanis, tell us where do they get this? Um, where do they find the course and, and all that kind of information? So it's being offered through Neura Learning, N-U-R-A Learning. And if you go to my website, which is just beccatarnas.com, the front page right now 
has the link to register for this course. And uh, we've tried to make it pretty accessible for a 12 week course. It's $150. And um, the just following that link from my website, beccatarnas.com to the neuro learning page. And it's all very kind of clear. And you just click register now. And that takes you to the page to sign up. And it has a, a description of everything that you'll get. I'm offering first six pre-recorded audio lectures that everyone can listen to when they finish the reading. And then there's seven live interactive um, Q&A sessions over Zoom. So we'll start on September 24th with the first of the live Q&A sessions. And I'm really going to just introduce what we're doing together and the plan for the 12 weeks. Uh, and then what? as soon as we finish that, we'll send out the first of the pre-recorded lectures Students will read book one of The Lord of the Rings, so from from Hobbiton to Rivendell, and that's kind of how I've mapped out the sy syllabus. I didn't want to give anything away in kind of doing the breakdown of the syllabus, but so I've just done it from place to place. Oh, it, I, it's you, it's a journey through an imaginal realm. I love how it's structured on the page because I looked at it and said, "Oh, look, it's actually Middle Earth. Like it's place to place yeah. to place in it." I think it's a, a great way of thinking with it. And I really think that kind of emphasizes something that the Tolkien scholar Tom Shippey says that Middle Earth itself is the main character of The Lord of the Rings. And I want to have the experience of journeying through it in that way. And while practices such as active imagination that I've been working with won't explicitly be part of it, I think that in reading the lord of the rings in a really immersive way we actually do kind of enter into sure. experiences of active imagination yeah, yeah try not to my goodness yeah. exactly <laughs> and i i think in a way that's how i've been so drawn into the work of active imagination is that i was already doing that from the very first time my teacher read the hobbit out loud when i was nine years old of walking through middle earth with these other figures and looking around that landscape and saying, I know I've been here and I really hope that I can be a guide to help others have that kind of experience in that world as well. Well, that's uh, wonderful. And uh, you will definitely be my guide. I'm, I'll be there front row center. Um, so of course the information about the, uh, the course and your website will be in the show notes for people listening, but anything else you got coming up? Any, any, any other places you, people can come and say hi, beccatanas.com and the newer learning page. Um, what else? Well, I, I felt really uh, honored by how many, events I've had lined up in the last couple years. And I actually very much credit our first conversation uh, on Rune Soup back in 2016 as kind of opening a doorway to a lot of different uh, events, workshops, talks, conferences that I've had the privilege to participate in or even to lead. And uh, the best way to keep track of what I'm doing is again my website beccatarnas.com i have an events page and i always keep it fully updated and uh i actually i have coming up a really exciting event um i'm participating in astrology summit 3.0 it's being put on by the astrology hub and this is from it's a free event it's online from september 23rd through the 29th and um, I did a, a pre-recorded interview for that discussing astrology as a spiritual practice. And then I'll also be participating in a live panel on September 25th. So actually the day after the Lord of the Rings gonna course starts. <laughs> it's going to be busy. Um, so I have that coming up at the end of this month. And then a month later, uh, in October, October 23rd, I'm going to be coming on to Adam Ellenboss's Nightlight Astrology School and giving a talk on the astrology of J.R.R. Tolkien. So for those who are interested in both 
Tolkien in Middle Earth and astrology, I'm going to be looking at Tolkien's natal chart, uh, his transits when he was doing some of his major works, and really kind of unpacking that. So it'll be a deep exploration of Tolkien and astrology. And I'm hoping to present it in such a way that people who know Tolkien will actually be able to grasp some uh, new material about astrology, that it can be a kind of learning astrological experience, and then also vice versa for astrologers to be able to have an introduction uh, to Tolkien if they're not familiar. And it can be great for people who are familiar with both too. But it's kind of bringing together my my two deep loves, the astrological world and the, the realm of Middle Earth. Fantastic. Well, well, Becca, this is... Um... I, I love these chats. I could do this. I, it's, it's such a good sunny Saturday morning activity to uh, to sit here and talk Lord of the Rings um, with yourself. So I've had a great time. And, uh, and thank you so much for your time. And see you in class, Teach. Oh, thank you so much. It's been so such a joy to talk with you. This is so enjoyable. And I am delighted that you will be in the class. And I hope many of your listeners will be able to join us as well. It's really been such a pleasure. Thank you. Well, for the Tolkien fans, hopefully that was the same feast for you that it was for me. For the yet-to-be Tolkien fans, hopefully my discussion with Dr. Tanas whetted your appetite to join the rest of us at what is, as far as you know, the cool kids' table. For the intransigent Tolkien holdouts, hi, Connor. Well, at least you got a really good walkthrough of the process of active imagination. And for the premium members currently embarking on the Magical Geography course, note that this week's episode pairs with the Wayfinding module, as it is about both navigating and also depicting the movement across a re-inspirited landscape. If you're keen to join Becca's Looming Book Club, the details are in the show notes, of course. And if you're just generally keen for more of this sort of thing, be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube, Spotify, or in your favorite podcatcher. Find out more at runesoup.com and find me on Twitter, where I am Gordon, G-O-I-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time. <laughs>